The people living in Star Trek's United Federation of Planets owe an awful lot to Nicholas Meyer. Not only did he co-write and direct what a lot of us consider to be the two best Star Trek movies ever made, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, he also co-wrote Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. And that's a terrific movie in its own right, but there's one particular moment that profoundly changes our understanding of life in the Federation. That change is so profound and establishes the everyday world inhabited by the heroes of Star Trek as being so different from our world that it forces me to wonder, how do the economics of Star Trek actually work? So, Star Trek IV. Our heroes have just arrived in San Francisco circa 1986, having traveled back in time from the 23rd century. Kirk steps out into traffic and is nearly run over by a car, presumably because in his century they have self-driving cars that automatically stop for pedestrians, which means entire generations of people have grown up not being taught to look both ways before crossing the street. Either that, or Kirk is an oblivious dipshit. Anyway, they make it across the street, and Kirk witnesses someone buying a newspaper from a coin-operated street rack. He turns to his comrades and says, They're still using money. We've got to find some. Also, they still have newspapers. How the hell far back in time did we come? Have whales even evolved yet? Whatever, the hilarious death of print media isn't the point. The point is, Star Trek IV is the first work of the franchise that clearly establishes that in the 23rd century, they don't use money. This is confirmed by another scene a bit later in the film, when Kirk is having dinner with Dr. Jillian Taylor. The time comes to pay the check, and Jillian turns to Kirk, who has told her the truth about who he is and where he comes from, and says, let me guess, you don't have money in the future either. And Kirk is like, we don't! Now, Nicholas Meyer was responsible for rewriting the portions of the Star Trek IV script that take place in 1986. I don't know if the lines about there being no money in the future were his, or leftovers from an earlier draft that he kept in, or Harve Bennett's idea. Maybe it was even Roddenberry's idea. He snuck into Harve Bennett's office and was paper clipping a note onto the script on the desk when Harve came in and was like, Roddenberry, what did I say would happen if I saw your ass in here again? And then security dragged Roddenberry away and the whole time he was screaming, but I'm an executive consultant on the film, an executive consultant. And then Harv turned around and read the note and was like, hmm, no money in the future. I like it. Meyer, put that in. And Meyer was there too, I guess, quietly sipping a coffee as the sounds of the guards pummeling Roddenberry with truncheons were dimly audible from the hallway. However those lines got there, they were in the draft that Nick Meyer handed in, and they made it on screen, so for my money... Did you catch that? Nick Meyer deserves credit, I did it again, for establishing this particular aspect of Star Trek's utopian future. Once it was established, it stuck. Star Trek The Next Generation debuted the year after Star Trek IV, and it reiterated the notion that money was no longer in use on Earth at the end of its first season in an episode called The Neutral Zone. While the climax of this story is the first appearance of the Romulans in TNG, most of the episode is spent following a trio of 20th century humans who are discovered in suspended animation and revived aboard the Enterprise. One of them is this guy, Ralph Offenhaus, who wakes up on a spaceship in the 24th century and is like, where's my money? I want to check on my money. I have lots of money and I want it. I want my money. Data seems to find Ralph interesting as an anthropological curiosity. Riker and Picard regard him with a mixture of pity and annoyance. At one point, Ralph says to Picard, I need to check how my investments are doing. Get me a copy of the Wall Street Journal. And Picard is like, the Wall Street Journal? When were you frozen? The Pleistocene? Picard goes on to tell him, look, you've been on ice for over 300 years. A lot has changed. There's no more hunger. There's no more want. There's no longer a selfish need to accumulate things. We've grown out of our infancy. So suck on that, you greedy jerk. Years later, Picard explains it again to Lily Sloan in the film Star Trek First Contact. Lily, who is from the 21st century and has survived the devastation of the Third World War, marvels at the resources required to build a ship the size of the Enterprise. And Picard says, the economics of the future are somewhat different. 
understatement. He continues, money doesn't exist in the 24th century. The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. Sounds pretty sweet, right? No more poverty, life no longer being defined by the constant struggle to meet basic material needs. But how does that work? And is that just a fantasy? Or is an economy like the one we catch glimpses of in Star Trek actually possible? And if the Federation doesn't use money, how the hell does it interact with other societies that do use it? Like the Ferengi. The questions of how the economy of the Federation came about, how it works, and how it interacts with economies which operate according to different principles are never explicitly answered on screen. All we can do is make inferences and draw conclusions from evidence found in the various Star Trek films and TV shows. Those inferences and conclusions would carry a lot more weight if they were backed up with a solid grasp of the history and major theories of economics. Unfortunately, when it comes to that, I'm not your guy. But there are books about the economics of Star Trek, written by people who actually know about economics. And lucky for you, I can read. The two major books on the subject are Trekonomics by Manu Sadia and The Economics of Star Trek by Rick Webb. Both books are fascinating, reading them taught me more about both economics and Star Trek, and I am deeply indebted to them and their authors for informing and helping to shape the creation of this video. One of the things these books helped me to realize is that much of the shorthand we use to refer to the economy of the Federation is very misleading. For example, it's not at all unusual to hear casual fans and hardcore Trekkies describe the Federation as communist. But based on what we see on screen throughout the franchise, that doesn't seem to be the case. While commerce as we know it doesn't seem to take place within the Federation, the capitalist notion of private property clearly still exists. Joseph Sisko doesn't charge the patrons at his restaurant for their meals, but it's still his restaurant, his property, his establishment. Captain Picard's family still owns the estate they've lived on for generations, an estate which is the site not only of what looks like a pretty nice house, but also a decent-sized winemaking operation. We also get to see a recreation of Captain Kirk's house when Picard encounters him in the Nexus in Star Trek Generations. At one point, Kirk mentions that he sold this house years ago. Given everything else that's been established about the economics of the Federation, we can assume that Kirk is speaking figuratively, but it also indicates that people can acquire or relinquish ownership of private property through personal transactions. Intellectual property rights still exist as well. There's a whole episode of Star Trek Voyager about that subject, Author Author, where the holographic doctor fights to be legally recognized as an artist with the right to control the distribution of his work. Federation society also includes hierarchies, both formal and informal. There's Starfleet, most obviously, which utilizes a military-style rank system and chain of command, but there are also indications throughout the various TV shows and films that quality of life within the Federation can differ dramatically depending on where you are. Earth itself is, as Ben Sisko describes it somewhat resentfully at one point, a paradise. But other Federation worlds, particularly outlying colonies, sometimes seem to have it pretty rough. At least by Federation standards. When you really look at it, the Federation functions a lot more like a capitalist economy than a communist one. Sure, it's a fairy tale version of capitalism, with no inequality, no exploitation of labor, everyone's basic needs met and then some, and people motivated by a combination of self-improvement and social responsibility, but hey, that's probably how capitalism is going to work here before long, too, once we iron out the last few wrinkles. Right? On-screen evidence suggests that the no-money, no-poverty economy is in place on Earth by sometime in the 22nd century. Apparently, humanity is motivated to iron out those wrinkles following the one-two punch of World War III and first contact with the Vulcans. Faced with the prospect of having to rebuild after a conflict that had left over half a billion people dead, plus finding out that we are not alone in the universe, we decide to finally get our act together. And all it took was an unfathomably devastating worldwide nuclear war and aliens coming down from out of the sky and offering to help. Go us! 
In The Economics of Star Trek, Rick Webb pegs the Federation as having a proto-post-scarcity economy, which he describes as, quote, essentially European socialist capitalism vastly expanded to the point where no one has to work unless they want to. Webb stops short of calling the Federation economy truly post-scarcity because we see that there are, in fact, certain things of which there is not an unlimited supply. Dilithium crystals, for example, are essential to starship operations, but can't be replicated and have to be mined. Plus, even things that are theoretically in abundance, like food, can still be unevenly distributed throughout the Federation. Famine never seems to be a concern on Earth, but we hear about it on Federation colonies from time to time. Medicine is another example. The Enterprise's mission in the TNG episode Code of Honor involves obtaining a vaccine needed to treat an outbreak of a disease on a Federation planet. During the TNG era, matter replicators are commonplace, but their availability doesn't seem to be unlimited. In the Deep Space Nine episode For the Cause, we're told that following the Cardassian withdrawal from Bajor, the Federation gave Bajor two industrial replicators to help them rebuild. I'm sure two industrial replicators were a big help, but I bet four would have been a bigger help. Or ten. Why only two? Perhaps because the Federation doesn't have the resources to just hand out unlimited industrial replicators to whoever needs them? The industrial replicators the Federation provides to Bajor are apparently a gift, not a trade. But not every transaction between the Federation and one of the galaxy's other nation-states works that way. Trade still exists. But that's not hard to figure out. You don't necessarily need money for that. If the Klingons have something the Federation needs, the Klingons can just ask for something the Federation has that they need in exchange. But what happens in situations where such a trade isn't possible? That's one of the reasons money was invented in the first place, to facilitate trades where simple barter isn't sufficient to satisfy all the involved parties. With money, if you have something I need, I don't have to count on having something that you need that I can trade for it. We can just reach an agreement over how much money you'll accept in exchange for the thing I need, and that will be the trade. And it works because, in the words of Homer Simpson's brain, money can be exchanged for goods and services. Sure, the Federation does have abundant, if not quite unlimited resources, and replicators, so it could probably provide almost anything a potential trading partner could want. But what if it can't? And doesn't a purely barter-based system seem a little, I don't know, primitive and inefficient when we're talking about trade being conducted between massive interstellar empires? How can that possibly work? The answer is obvious. They use money. They just do. It's canon. It's established on screen multiple times. The Federation uses money. How can we reconcile that with all the times we've seen Star Trek characters state unambiguously that the Federation doesn't use money? I think it depends on how the money is being used and what kind of money we're talking about. It seems pretty inarguable that money isn't used within the Federation. People don't get paid at their jobs, which is fine because everything is free. When Kirk and Picard and others say money doesn't exist in the Federation, that's what they mean. But money does still exist in other places. The most obvious examples of this are the Ferengi. As satires of modern-day capitalists, the Ferengi love money more than just about anything. Their currency of choice is gold-pressed latinum, which is prized because it's rare and impossible to replicate. Webb proposes that the Federation simply maintains stores of foreign currency, not unlike real-world governments do today. If the Ferengi Alliance wants to purchase some goods from the Federation, they might offer a certain amount of gold-pressed latinum in exchange. And since the Federation's material needs are relatively few, they can accept the deal, give the Ferengi the goods they want, and just squirrel away the latinum for a rainy day. Maybe they use it in future trades with the Ferengi, or with other states where it's a valued currency. Maybe they dole it out to Starfleet personnel, stationed in areas where they'll be interacting with non-Federation societies that still use money. That would explain how Dr. Crusher is able to buy fabric at Farpoint Station, or how the Starfleet crew on Deep Space Nine can pay for their drinks at Quark's. Watch enough Star Trek, and you'll also catch a few references here and there to something called the Federation Credit. It's mentioned a few times in Classic Trek, before the whole moneyless economy thing is firmly established in canon, and it comes up once or twice in the TNG era, too.
How can we accept that the Federation doesn't use money when there's a thing called the Federation credit in what seems to be fairly widespread use? Webb has an answer for that one too. He suggests that the Federation credit isn't actually issued or backed by the Federation government. Instead, it's a widely accepted private currency, like Bitcoin, or those tickets you can win and trade for prizes at the arcade, I guess. Like I told you before, my understanding of economics is somewhat wobbly. Before we move on, can I say one more thing about the Ferengi? Because there's this one line Quark has that has bothered me for a long time. It's in the episode The Gem Hadar, where Quark has invited himself along on a camping trip with Sisko, Jake, and Nog. There's this tension between Sisko and Quark the whole trip, and then they're captured by the Gem Hadar, and there's a point where Quark just cuts loose on him, calling him out on his anti Ferengi prejudice and his hypocrisy. Quark says to Sisko, You know, you humans think you're pretty high. Hot shit, but you forget that you used to be a lot like us. In fact, you used to be worse than us. Look at your history. Slavery, war, concentration camps. We Ferengi don't have anything that approaches that kind of barbarism in our past. Excuse me? We see that Ferengi society is driven by a single-minded devotion to the profit motive. Employers are encouraged to exploit their employees. Negotiators are expected to try and screw people on deals. Are we really supposed to believe, given how we see Ferengi society operating in the 24th century, that slavery is something they never engaged in on any scale at any point in their history? Now the thing is, and I know some of you bristle when I make this point, Star Trek is totally made up. There are no actual Ferengi. There is no actual Ferengi history. If the writers of Star Trek say the Ferengi never practiced slavery, then the Ferengi never practiced slavery. That's not what bothers me about that line. What bothers me is that it posits a form of capitalism where the most brutal forms of exploitation just never happen. It presents a scenario where the most ruthless and amoral capitalists imaginable can occupy a moral high ground against a utopian society like 24th century Earth because, hey, they might literally worship money, but at least they never own slaves. As if the former, left unchecked, doesn't lead inevitably to the latter. The Federation economy is probably a fantasy, relying as it does not just on a serious commitment to economic equality and social welfare, but also to things like replication technology, interstellar trade, and cheap, clean, renewable energy sources like fusion. But even if it is a fantasy, it can still be instructive. Imagine how profoundly our lives would change if we no longer had to trade our labor for money in order to survive. Seriously, take a few seconds and imagine that. Your basic needs, food, clothing, housing, healthcare, are covered. You don't need to earn them. You don't need to pay for them. They are yours from the day you're born till the day you die. You can still work if you want. But you can choose the work you do based on what it means to you. If you want to work outside, you can work outside. If you want to be a builder, you can be a builder. If you want to write, you can write. If you want to paint, you can paint. Now imagine that it's like that for every other person on the planet too. No hunger, no homelessness, no poverty. And in the absence of a profit motive, Society is instead organized around principles of equality, tolerance, and social responsibility. As Captain Picard tells Lily in First Contact, we work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. That world would be virtually unrecognizable to us. And what does that say about the world we have now? So is it possible for us to realize something like the economy we see on Star Trek's Earth of the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th centuries? In his book Treconomics, Manu Sadia speculates that it might be. Sadia writes of the great British economist John Maynard Keynes, who identified scarcity as the fundamental economic problem. 
Writing in 1930, Keynes predicted that economic growth would put an end to scarcity and the struggle for subsistence within 100 years. That was overly optimistic, as it turns out. The global economy has not grown as quickly as Keynes predicted it would, and the end of the struggle for subsistence is not right around the corner for the vast majority of people. But that doesn't mean there's no reason to hope that we'll still get there someday. In Chapter 9 of Treconomics, Sadia writes, quote, Star Trek paints an ideal picture of late 20th century America and Europe, or rather of its expected trajectory. The political franchise has been expanded to all citizens. Poverty and crime have receded thanks to rational welfare policies, and people are finally free to enjoy life without worries. And on the final page of the chapter, Saudi writes, quote, Such a world is far from a guaranteed outcome. While public goods and abundance are spreading, so is economic inequality. We will need considerable efforts, wisdom, and cooperation to steer society on a new course. The wealthiest among us will have to reallocate the bulk of their fortunes to society. Above all, we will need more public goods and more positive externalities. Star Trek teaches us that humanity's wondrous inventions do not fully realize their potential until they are freely shared. As Sadi himself acknowledges throughout his book, the economy of the Federation is science fiction, but unlike many elements of Star Trek, it's not an unattainable fantasy. We'll never be able to travel from star system to star system at hundreds of times the speed of light. And even if we could, whoever's out there waiting for us, they ain't Vulcans. But we could reorganize our societies in ways that allow everyone's basic needs to be met and detach our ability to survive from our ability to work. Right now, the wealthiest 26 people in the world own as much as the poorest 3.8 billion people. In the United States, there are several times as many vacant homes as there are homeless people. And despite there being enough food produced to feed every single person on the planet, nearly 800 million people suffer from hunger and malnutrition around the world. We don't have the practically inexhaustible resources of Earth in Star Trek's 24th century, but we do have the means to end hunger, homelessness, and extreme poverty, if only we would put the resources we do have to better use. A bit earlier in that ninth chapter of Treconomics, Manu Sadia writes, quote, The one thing I learned from watching Star Trek is that post-scarcity is not some kind of naturally occurring phenomenon or weather event. It will not fall into place. It is not preordained. Post-scarcity is a set of policy choices. Technological progress and economic growth cannot bring us to utopia on their own. Inventions do not arise in a vacuum. They are artifacts of society. They respond to people's needs and, sometimes, demands. How do the economics of Star Trek work? They work because the people of Earth, and beyond it, the Federation, decided that they cared more about basic rights and justice and quality of life than they cared about money. Right now, there are a million obstacles between a world organized according to those priorities and the world we have. But most of those obstacles are human-made. We put them up. We could take them down. We don't have to wait for another world war or for benevolent extraterrestrials to descend from the stars. We could start to do it right now. We could. All of that from a couple of lines that were played for laughs in Star Trek IV. Good job, Nick.
Well, there you have it, folks. That was the video on the economics of Star Trek. I hope I did an okay job. I hope I made that as interesting for you as it was for me to research and write. This is one of my favorite videos of this series so far. I really dug being able to come at Star Trek from a very different angle. And I'm going to tell you about the next video in the Trek Actually series in a minute. But first, I want to give some shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons. These folks are people who have become Patreon patrons of mine at a level of $5 per month or more since the last Trek Actually video, and their names are Cassandra Cadigan. Thank you, Cassandra. Audrin and Nate Thorne. Thank you, Audrin and Nate. Fluffy Foxy Boy. Thank you, Fluffy Foxy Boy. Mark Jenkins. Thank you, Mark. Maps of Bliss and Rage. Thank you, Maps of Bliss and Rage. Sean Selman, thank you, Sean. Trent Sutherland, thank you, Trent. Mick Ronix, thank you, Mick Ronix. Edwin Peng, thank you, Edwin. Jay Carter, thank you, Jay Carter. Danny Anglin, thank you, Danny. Adam Smith from the House of Quark, thank you, Adam. Treva Jax, thank you, Treva Jax. Philip Poole, thank you, Philip. Dennis Koroshev, thank you, Dennis. Adam, thank you, Adam. Elizabeth, thank you, Elizabeth. Jamie J, thank you, Jamie J. Thomas Fitchett, thank you, Thomas. Jean-Paul Frenet, thank you, Jean-Paul. Matt Weaver, thank you, Matt. Ahoyerno, thank you, Ahoyerno. Kizzy, thank you, Kizzy. Michael Stipp, thank you, Michael. Kurt Ratz Productions, thank you, Kurt Ratz Productions. Philip Coffey, thank you, Philip. Jan Beek from Willich, Germany, EU, thank you, Jan. Andrew Paris, thank you, Andrew. Jimmy1985, thank you, Jimmy1985. Soren Pinoco, thank you, Soren. Chris Tucker, thank you, Chris. Matthew Zeidman, thank you, Matthew. And Michael Carver, thank you, Michael. Thank you to everybody who is my Patreon patron at whatever level you are pledging, however long you have been pledging. If you are a patron of $5 per month or more, you get a shout out at the end of Trek actually. And if you are a patron of any level, you get to vote on future Trek Actually topics. And the poll for October's topic is up on my Patreon page today. If you're watching this video right as soon as it's uploaded, you might have to wait a few hours, but the day this video is uploaded at noon Eastern time, the poll for October's Trek Actually topic will be up. Anyone who is a patron at any level can vote to help choose that month's Trek Actually topic. So check that out. I also want to remind you, if you dig my YouTube stuff, and especially if you like the Star Trek stuff, you should be listening to The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I co-host along with the brilliant and hilarious Jason Harding. Jason and I play characters. We play low-ranking officers on a certain famous Federation starship as it embarks on a certain historic five-year mission. I think you see where I'm going here. It's a ton of fun for us to do. A lot of you have listened to The Ensign's Log and had very nice things to say about it. If you haven't checked out the Ensign's Log yet and you like the Star Trek videos I do, check out the Ensign's Log. Give it a listen. The links are in the description of this video. You can subscribe via RSS using your favorite podcast app, or you can listen on the website, on SoundCloud, or at lemmelistenpodcasts.com. Check out the Ensign's Log. Now, here is what's going to be the topic for next month's Trek actually video. The winner of the most recent concluded poll, and this is something that again is a little bit outside the box and something I'm looking forward to, able to approach Star Trek from a slightly different angle, kind of like I did with the economics topic in this month's video. Next month's Trek actually video will be on the subject of, is Star Trek actually less progressive than you think? Of course, we all know if we're Star Trek fans, Star Trek is one of the most progressive, one of the most self-consciously progressive science fiction shows, television shows of any genre period that's ever been produced. But what about the times when Star Trek falls a little short? What about the times when there are certain elements of Star Trek, of its premise, of the way it's executed, of the way it tells its stories, that actually aren't 
as progressive as the creators of Star Trek or we as the fans of Star Trek might want it to be. So that's going to be a really interesting subject to take a critical look at the progressivism of Star Trek and the times where maybe Star Trek wasn't quite as progressive as it wanted to be or as we might hope it would be. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you enjoy that one when it comes out next month. I hope you enjoyed this one about the economics of Star Trek. I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.